platform today on brace building. And he's going to talk about about the basics of fence construction. And really, the, the braces are so important in getting a good fencing system. And he'll, he'll talk about that today, too. So Thank you. Right? I'll try to do as good a job as Lewis, but mate, I don't know. Like he said, I'm Clay Brewer from State Tough Fencing. I'm based out of Tennessee. Uh, the company is based out of Texas. We used to be in New Brunswick, Texas. Uh, we've since moved to Houston, the plant and office. Everything is in Houston now. Uh, we kind of got our start in the deer fence industry in Texas. They raise deer and other wild game like people raise cattle and horses around here. So they needed a wire that was uh, stronger and would take more impact, uh, cost a little less to install, but still do the job uh, over traditional woven wire. We've been doing these uh, fence schools since 2008, I think, uh, and we didn't have near as many this year as we did last year, but uh, COVID and certain things have hindered us a little. <clears throat> All right, why do we need a fence? Do you have an old fence that needs to be replaced? Have you bought a new property uh, that doesn't have a fence? Then the next thing, what are we trying to do with the fence? Uh, are we trying to keep things in or are we trying to keep things out? Uh, around here, you're not going to see it as much, but out west, you get out there, they have to keep things out of their hay piles, uh, different things. Around here, we're typically going to be trying to keep things in. Uh, I know there's probably some small ruminant people in here that might need to keep predators and stuff out, but uh, you know, most of what we're going to talk about today is going to be trying to keep things in. Consider all your options. She talked about planning a little bit. Um, we're going to really, really stress this. Um, we like to draw stuff out on graph paper, or if you don't have paper, a napkin. Anything is, uh, you know, better than nothing. We, uh, we're going to go into some details about how we install the post, which makes it very difficult to change your plans if you don't like what you have. So try to take the time up front, um, lay out where you want gates, where you want water troughs, uh, what are you going to do with the fence? Are you going to use the fence to drive cattle or horses or whatever into barns? Are you using them as weaning pens? Um, all that stuff needs to be taken into consideration. Do you need predator control? Things like that. Also, we need to know our property. Uh, like I said earlier, if you've just bought a farm and you need to fence, you need to get out and walk the property. Uh, find out what uh, the challenges you're going to run into are. That way you kind of have a plan of attack. <clears throat> the next thing, start with a clean fence line. You need to have an updated survey uh, and you need to try to keep it as close to the property line as possible. I'm not going to go into great detail on this. I think y'all have a lawyer coming that's going to talk to you about this. I don't even want to get into the laws and all that because that's his department. Uh, but <clears throat> nowadays with post drivers, bigger equipment, uh, stuff like that, it, it will be money well spent and uh, you'll be time and money ahead if you will go in there and clean out and get a you know get a clean slate to start with this is a picture here uh, this this was a pretty thick woods and uh, I simply went in there hired a, a track hoe and he went in around it and that's not near as big a swath as it looks like it's probably only about 30 feet but as you can tell it didn't take him long uh, you know it's a little expensive but a couple hours later, he had it cleared out and I could drive a tractor, whatever we need to down through there. Makes a big difference when you're trying to keep things straight and, and get your posts set and everything like they need to be. We use survey flags and paint. Uh, you'll see when we go to the farm today, I think there's a flag or two still sitting there where we're going to drive some posts. Um, we, we try to lay it out and plant it ahead of time, like I said. We use paint on the ground for to mark gates or to mark where our post needs to be. That way we can look at it and say, okay, this is what I want. No, I don't like the way that's going to be. Uh, we drive all our wood posts. I'm going to talk about that in a minute, but uh, if, you've ever, if you haven't ever driven a post, once you drive a wooden post, there's hardly any getting it back out of the ground. So you drive a post here and then two days later you think, boy, I wish I had done that different. Uh, it's it's going to be very challenging. So try to take your time and lay it out with paint, flags, anything. Uh, to kind of get a visual uh, idea of, of how you want it. Select the proper fence fabric. For years, everybody thought 1047 6 uh, traditional woven wire was the only pattern on the market. If you wanted a woven wire fence, that was it. You went to the farm store, they had one or two rolls of it. 
that was the only fence of choice. Um, goat people hate it because they get their head hung in it. Horse people hate it. It's not tall enough. Uh, but that is not the case. There's many, many, many different patterns of wire if you know what you're looking at. Um, and there's a few key things, series of numbers on, on I guess, every manufacturer's label um, that we'll go over that'll teach you how to know what that roll of wire is um, at the feed store when you walk up to it and look at it. Um, so when we're deciding what material we need, we have to go back and take into consideration what we're going to do with the fence. Is it a perimeter fence uh, where all we're doing is fencing off 100 acres and we have plenty of grass and the cattle are not going to try to get out? You know, we can, we can use maybe a little shorter fence with a little uh, further spacing between our vertical stays to, to be a little more cost efficient. If we're going to build a weaning pen or a, a sorting facility or a catch pen or something like that, we probably want a taller fence with a tighter vertical stay pattern that will withstand a little more pressure. Um, if we are running small ruminants and we're trying to keep goats and sheep in, which if you all have those, that's like trying to fence in mice most of the time, so that's pretty difficult, or we're trying to keep dogs out or coyotes or whatever. So uh, different fabrics do different things. Every manufacturer should, somewhere on the label, have a series of numbers like you see here. Uh, on, on our particular label, uh, our label is the same size as a sheet of paper and it'll be in the top right hand corner. When you go to the store and you see a roll of wire, it's hard to tell what that pattern is, but if you know what these numbers mean, you can look at them and that will explain or tell you what, what the fabric is. So these are the, the series of numbers that we use. Um, your first set of numbers here is the number of horizontal lines and the height. So the first number, nine, is nine horizontal lines in the fence. Um, that number could be as high as, as 20, um, 20 horizontal lines. The next set of numbers, 49, that's the height of the fence. So this fence here is 49 inches tall. The second series of numbers is the distance between the vertical stays of the fence. So in this particular case it's 12 inches. Um, that pattern is more a perimeter type fence. It's a little more economical. Um, even though it's high tensile and it will withstand a great impact, that may not be the best choice if you're building somewhere you know that you're going to wean calves in or you're going to use it as a wing fence or you know where, where it's going to have some pressure that might not be the best option and then the last set of numbers is simply the amount of uh, material on that roll so uh, 330 feet is the most common that has to do with a long time ago they did everything in rods and I'm not even going to get into that because I, I don't know what all that even used to mean but nowadays you can get it in uh, we, we manufacture several rolls in 500 feet um, you can even get it in 660 feet depending on the pattern that you choose. And uh, it all deals with weight is, is the reason we don't make bigger uh, rolls. Uh, so several different rolls here that you might you know, see at a store. This is a 13486500. So this, this fence has 13 lines, 13 horizontal lines, but it's only 48 inches tall. So even though it's an inch shorter than that one, it has more horizontal lines. So there's more uh, wire in that fabric. It'll take more of an impact. It's more of a sheep and goat, a uh, weaning facility fence, wing fence, something like that. Uh, this is a, a deer fence, uh, 20, 20 horizontal lines, 96 inches tall. So that's an eight foot tall fence. We make fence from three foot all the way to 10 foot actually. So probably won't see much of that around here. Uh, 8423, that would be uh, more like a horse fence or, or a sheep and goat fence. Uh, it's going to be a very small pattern, very small hole, three inches in between your vertical stays. It's a shorter fence, only 42 inches tall. Uh, and typically, uh, the smaller the vertical stay, the shorter the roll of wire is going to be just due to weight. This is a picture of our label. As you can see, like I said, it's up here in the top right-hand corner. Um, most manufacturers somewhere on their label have have th this series of numbers. Uh, this is just another picture of a, of a goat fence here and you can see that's that's a 660 foot roll there actually. Alright, she stressed on high tensile wire and, uh, and other things. 
if you have the choice, you always want to stay with a high tensile wire. Uh, low carbon wire, woven wire, was great in its day, but like other things, um, that's sort of a thing of the past. We want to try to stay with a high tensile wire, if at all possible. High tensile wire is going to have a lower installation cost. Um, it's going to have a, a whole lot less stretch. It's only going to stretch to about 1%, and it's going to have a higher breaking strength. Uh, several different options of galvanization uh, are offered, but um, in a high tensile situation, you want to try to stay with a class three galvanized wire. That is the highest class of galvanization um, that you can get. They have residential, commercial, class one, and class three, I think, is the, is the four different ones. Uh, you know, a lot of people would think commercial would be the best. It is not in the galvanization world. Class three is the best. So when you're comparing wires, if, if you look at, say, our product versus um, a competitor's high tensile wire, and theirs is $20 cheaper, whatever the role is, make sure you're comparing apples to apples. Theirs may be a class one wire. A class three wire, uh, like ours, is going to, you know, we guarantee our wire for 20 years. Um, but in saying that, everything we use to install the wire, as you'll see today in the field, the staples, the brace pins, everything is class three. Uh, we don't want to buy a class three wire and then go buy a cheap box of staples that's class one, and the staples rust off before the wire does. Uh, so, so that's a big deal. Make sure you're buying class three products. Um, and we'll talk about the, the breaking strength uh, here in a minute. Uh, low carbon wire has 28% carbon. High tensile wire has 64% carbon, so pretty well double the amount of carbon, which makes it a harder uh, wire. Uh, low carbon wire used in traditional woven wire. Uh, your typical 12 and a half gauge wire is going to break at about 560 pounds. Uh, high tensile wire, the same 12 and a half gauge wire in a high tensile product is going to break at around 1,500 pounds, so three times the breaking strength. Um, we get a lot of, you know, people say, well, I like using a big nine gauge woven wire because you can really see it and it, it's strong. Even a nine gauge wire is not as strong as a 12 and a half gauge high tensile wire. A nine gauge low carbon wire is going to break around 900 pounds. Um, so even though it's bigger and it looks tougher, um, it's, it's not. It, it does not have the same breaking strength you know, as a high tensile piece of wire. Um, I did a comparison kind of like she did. Um, most of my prices are like hers from a year ago. Even though the actual price may not be 100% accurate, um, it is uh, equal to, even though the prices are inflated now, you know, barbed wire still costs, low carbon barbed wire still costs a little more than high tensile so on and so forth. So you can still kind of get the feel for it. Um, this is going to be a, a basic thousand foot stretch of fence kind of like she did and we're just going to compare the differences. Uh, a lot of people when you say oh I need a new fence but I'd love a woven wire or I'd love a high tensile fence but I can't afford it. I'm going to have to put a barbed wire fence up and just be done with it. Uh, that may not be the case when you get into the real numbers like just like she was talking about. So here we're going to uh, compare a traditional five strand low carbon barbed wire fence versus a high tensile fixed knot fence with a strand of barbed wire on the top because um, that's kind of the the most basic what people think to be the cheapest fence versus the most high class most expensive fence people think it is anyway so we're going to compare those two all right so with a five strand barbed wire fence we're going to have to have a brace every 330 feet because it is a low carbon wire uh, we're going to have to have a line post 8 to 10 feet. Like she said, uh, if you're doing it on a cost share program, you're going to have to follow specs, and that is in the specs. And then you're going to have to have five separate pulls, or four, or whatever it is, however many um, strands of barbed wire you're going to install. So a lot of labor and products here. We move over to the fixed knot fence. We're going to need a brace every 1,320 feet, or in this case, just one on each end. Uh, high tensile wire is uh, you can put you can spo uh, space your post further apart so you don't need as, as many brace assemblies. You can put a brace every four rolls of wire is basically what that means. Uh, line post spacing can be 15 to 25 foot apart. 
depending on what you're doing with the fence. In this situation, we're just going to say it's a boundary fence, so we're going to space them a little further apart. And then we're going to have one pull to install the fixed knot, and then we'll have one pull to install the barbed wire. But, all right, so your cost of a five-strand barbed wire fence, we're going to have to have four brace assemblies, one at each end and then one every 330 feet, so it'll be two in the middle. $200 worth of, of post and brace pins. Nowadays, the way posts are hard to find in the, as much as they cost, that's not 100% accurate. But um, And then you're going to have to have roughly 100 T-posts, and that's putting them every 10 foot. Um, if you're doing it on a cost share, you're going to have even more than that because, like she said, I think she said you had to put them at eight. You're going to have to have five rolls of low-carbon barbed wire at $73. And then I just used a $1.50 a foot labor. Um, depending on where you are, that's pretty accurate. Where I live in West Tennessee, um, $1.50 is what most folks charge to install it. Uh, you go to a bigger city or closer to the city, the labor cost is going to increase like everything else does. Um, and a lot of times, people will charge more to install barbed wire because it's so aggravating. But for this case, we're going to leave the labor cost the same for everything. So you have a total cost of $2,465 for a five-strand barbed wire fence. Now, we'll go to the, oh, I'm sorry, yeah, five-strand barbed wire fence. I'm going to skip over that one. Now we're going to go to a high tensile fixed knot fence like I talked about. We only need two brace assemblies, so we've cut our brace cost and our brace materials in half right off the bat. We're only going to need 65 T-posts because we're spacing them further apart. So we've cut our T-post almost in half. We're still going to need four rolls of wire and five rolls, counting the barbed wire. And then we left our labor cost the same, $1,500. So that was $2,485. So, so basically, um, for $20 per se, you can have a high tensile woven wire fence over a traditional five-strand barbed wire fence. Um, even though when you go to the store, sometimes you think, boy, that wire costs more. Um, I tried to get these prices from dealers that we were dealing with at the time. Like I said, these prices are, are not accurate right now, but you, you get the gist of the, of the thing. Uh, low carbon wire takes so much more materials uh, that a lot of times your cost per foot of fence is going to be more expensive than the actual wire itself. So you need to look into those things when you're trying to decide what to use. It's not all about the cost of, of you know, the tag, the price tag on that roll of wire. These are some machines in Houston that make our product. Uh, we have, I think now we have eight or nine of these machines in Houston. And if they're making four foot tall fence or shorter, 49 inch fence or shorter, they can make two rolls at a time. Uh, right now, production is at an all-time high like it is with any manufacturer. We're running the plant 24-7, uh, three shifts. So, um, But this, this machine, they come from overseas. New Zealand um, is, is who makes these. As you can see here, uh, you can see the actual fixed knot. Uh, you, it'll be, you can see it better when we get to the field. But, but the main difference in a fixed knot fence and a hinge joint fence because you can buy a uh, high tensile hinge joint fence. They do make that. We make that. Uh, it's a it's a selling product. A lot of people like it. But but we want to try to stay with a fixed knot fence. Um, and the reason for that is a fixed knot fence has a solid stay wire from the top to the bottom that acts as a fence post. A traditional hinge joint fence is going to have one strand of wire that comes from from the bottom and it's going to wrap around the next. Then a separate piece from there to there, wrap around, separate piece. So you've created a hinge. Every horizontal line has a hinge. So when something pushes down on it or runs into it, it hinges. Um, it, it's not made to stand up unless it's, it's tied or tied to the post. Our fence has a solid stay wire from the top to the bottom, and then a third piece of wire actually forms the, the fixed knot. So the stay acts as a fence post. It keeps it standing upright. Um, if a tree falls on it, if a bull jumps it, whatever the case may be, even though it might take a little damage, it's going to stay standing up better than a hinge joint fence. And also the knots, the way the knots are tied on the wire, you'll see when we get to the field, they take several hundred pounds to move one knot. 
Um, hinge joint, you can almost slide up and down the wire right out of the you know roll by hand. So if a cow or something sticks her nose through it and tries to eat uh, your neighbor's green grass where he hadn't weed eated or sprayed the fence line, they won't spread the fence apart with a fixed knot fence. It takes a whole lot more to, to move those knots than it does a traditional hinge joint fence. Yes, sir. That makes a big difference. That uh, that is. No, we uh, we'll go over it in the field. You can stretch up to f about four rolls at a time, th thirteen hundred feet roughly. When you do that, and and we'll go over it more in the field. I I'll touch on it here. But when you do that, sometimes you have to pull it in the center. You'll use two stretcher bars. Probably a, uh, a method that nobody here has ever seen and, and may not uh, believe in until you actually see it. But no, you, you don't have to pull it more often. You, you can pull up to 1,300 feet at one time. Yeah, and, and we'll go over that more in the field too. Um, no, we do not want to pull the crimp completely out. But when I install it out there, we'll we'll go over it where we can actually see it and, and go over why we why we do that. These are some pictures off our well, that one's off our Facebook page. Uh, the office in the old office in New Brunswick used to be by an airplane or an airport, and that plane ran off the track into the high tensile fence. And even though it did tear it up a little, it stopped the plane. And this is this is a picture of a, actually a contractor in my area. Last winter, it got muddy and his skid steer slid down the hill and ran into the fence. And it did break the post off, but as you can see, that's 1348.12, and it stopped his 8,000 pound skid steer, whatever that weighs. So pretty tough, pretty tough fence. Um, the, the solid vertical stay wires, uh, everybody says, well, I don't want to use woven wire because I got to go over a hill and through the woods. That's a false statement. If you say that, you, you, hadn't, you haven't been to one of these schools to see, I guess, but the solid stay wire really makes it follow the terrain of the or the ground or the terrain better uh, it, it'll withstand a limb falling on it or a tree falling on it or something like that like she said you may have to pull the staples out and it may break your post over but once everything gets stood back up it's pretty well going to stand back up because it has no choice but to do that because it has one solid stay wire all throughout the fence this is just another picture here you can see the quite a bit of grade there we did drive a uh, six inch post at the bottom of the of the grade but the, the wire flows right with the ground all right so once we've decided what fence material we're going to or what fence pattern we're going to use now we need to uh, select our post in this area 99 percent of people are going to use wood posts you get out yes sir uh, no uh, I think the post broke yeah, I think it, it slid some knots over in that instance, but like I'll show you out there, you can uh, spray some WD-40 on there and take a pair of pliers and move your knots back over. Once you get everything lined back up, it has no choice but to be standing straight up again. No, uh-uh. And we'll show you how to build the braces so it does that today. That's right. I had I had a probably a hundred year oak tree fall on one last year and I should have taken pictures but it was pouring down rain and like everybody else I did not want to be out there cutting a tree off my fence but anyway I had a, a 949 which is what we're going to install today and a strand of barbed wire on top on wood post every 15 foot and the tree fell right in between the post it did break the barbed wire uh, and it broke the top strand of the fence but I cut the tree off and sprayed it with WD-40 straightened all the stays up and I did have to crimp the top wire back together, but, but I bet if you drove out there now, you couldn't tell where the fence fell on, the, or the tree fell on the fence. So it's very resilient. Uh, out west, you're going to see a lot of pipe, probably not around here just because uh, you can't get pipe very easily around here out west. They have all oil fields. So we're going to use wood posts around here, primarily pine, yellow pine. Uh, this is just a, a pipe fence here, uh, as you can see, kind of another option. What to consider when sourcing fence posts. Back before the pandemic and all the craziness in the world when you could go anywhere you wanted to go and get a fence post, there were several different options 
and things you needed to look at when buying them. Nowadays, if you can find a fence post, you better buy it. But um, it all has to do with how they treat the post, uh, of whose posts are better than others. Um, Madison Post Company uh, used to be probably one of the premier post manufacturers. Uh, around here, you're going to have Green River and some other post manufacturers that also do a very good job. But the key to that is, pro uh, is the process that they use to treat the post. Um, this is a drying yard here. Um, what good post manufacturers do is when they get the trees or whatever in and they get them cut into fence post sizes, they need to let them dry on the yard for several weeks and, and let all the moisture dry as much as possible. Treatment. Um, a lot of people like to use a dimensional lumber. There's two different classes of CCA treatment. Uh, CCA being the chrominated copper, copper arsenate, or however, however you pronounce the first word there. Um, a ground contact or an agricultural treated fence post is going to have 0.4 of the treatment. Um, that is that is for ground contact and for fence use. Um, dimensional lumber is going to have a 0.15 amount of treatment, so about half, a little less than half the treatment. So if you go to Lowe's or Home Depot or the hardware store and you buy 6x6 six six to use as a fence post, uh, that will not work because it has not even half the amount of treatment. It is not made for ground contact. It is made for weather exposure but not ground contact. So we want to stay away from dimensional lumber or two befores or anything, or anything uh, that is going to have a residential amount of treatment. We want to stay with an agricultural amount of treatment on our post. Um, the treatment process, like I said, they want to leave the post on the yard and let them dry as long as possible. Then they're going to put them into a vacuum and suck out what remaining moisture is in the post. Then they're going to put them in a pressurized cylinder and install the chemical and push that chemical hopefully all the way to the core of the post. If the post is wet and not dried properly, then it cannot absorb the treatment like it needs to. So that's why it's so important that they that manufacturers let their post dry and that you're buying a, a post that has been dried outside and not just cut and put right in the vacuum. Uh, we want them to air dry for several weeks before treatment. And then the you know the final treatment is they, they empty them out and, and make sure the chemical went all the way to the heart. Selecting the best post size. Um, as you'll see today on the farm, we used all, I think those were probably seven to eight inch posts, big, strong posts. Um, typically in an application like you'll see today, a six to seven inch diameter corner post and brace post is plenty acceptable. Uh, we do need them to be eight foot long, no shorter than eight foot long. Um, because we will drive the post, and here in a minute we'll go over the difference in a driven and a, dig, a dug post. But our corner posts need to be no smaller than a six inch post. That will go back to voiding your warranty on your wire. If I come to your farm and you've used a four inch corner post, you probably can't warranty your wire. So we want to stay with a, at least a six inch by eight foot long corner post. For every diameter, for every inch bigger post, some manufacturers say you get around 10 years more life. So, like the post you'll see today, seven to eight inch post, they typically should last 10 years longer than a six to seven inch post. So when you're going to the farm store and you're trying to decide which post to buy, if there's only two or three or four dollars difference in a seven to eight inch post or a six to seven inch post, I don't know about you, but I don't want to have to fence all the time. So the $4 difference may be more beneficial to you. You may just go on and spend the money up front, buy a little bigger post, get a few more years of life, um, and you won't have to worry about it. Then on your line post, if you do need to save a little money, if you went ahead and you bought the bigger corner post, you can skimp back a little on the line post. Um, in, a, in a high tensile fence situation, the line posts basically are just to keep the fence at the right height off the ground. They will withstand some impact, but like you saw, the skid steer will 
if it takes a huge impact, the line post might break over, but the wire will not. We're basically building a vertical trampoline is what we want to do. So if you do need to save a little money, save your money in the line post. Buy a, shorter, a little bit shorter line post if you have to. You can probably get away with a seven foot line post. You know, and if you had to, you could go back to a three to four. We really don't want to go any smaller than a four. We try to recommend a four to five inch line post. Um, and, and, we, and they're in series like this, three to four, four to five, because most posts are tapered, uh, just like a tree that's growing in the forest. So when you go buy a bundle of posts, if you tell the, the manager at the store you want a six inch post, he's probably going to sell you a five to six or a six to seven. Uh, because they're tapered and that's how the bu uh, post bundles are labeled. But, like I said, if, if you need to save a little money, save your money in the line post. Don't skimp on the corners. The corners are the foundation of the fence. Um, gates, gate posts, like I said, we, we, you know, we want to use bigger posts for gate posts, obviously. Landscape timbers, uh, dimensional lumber, perfect post. This is a picture of a perfect post. I have a really good dealer in West Tennessee that buys lots and lots of wire, but they only buy perfect posts. So we've had this discussion before. Um, even though they're pretty and they drive really well, we want to try to, st and they are agricultural treated posts, we want to try to stay away from a perfect post. Um, what they do to a perfect post is they take a piece of lumber, they put it in a lathe, and they cut it and make it perfect. So it's exactly six inches at this end and it's exactly six inches at this end. So what they've done is after they get done running it through the lathe, they've taken meat off of it. Um, anytime you take meat or, or something like that off a piece of lumber, after a while it's going to bow or bend or get a crook in it. That's not what we want because if you go and spend all the time driving all these posts straight and then you come back in two years and it looks like that, you're going to be very disappointed. So we want to try to stay away from a perfect post. We want to use a peeled post, which is what you'll see today. A peeled post, they've taken a piece of uh, lumber, they've peeled the bark off of it, and they've cut it in an eight-foot section. That's all they've done to it. That is what we want to use because a peeled post, um, if it does have a crook or a bend or something like that, it's already in it, and it's going to be in it its whole life. So when you drive it, you can take that into consideration, and you can make them look straight. Um, out there on the farm, there were several posts that had some pretty significant bends or crooks in them, which you're going to get that with any manufacturer. Um, and we were able to drive them where they looked pretty straight. You probably won't be able to tell that they were crooked. Um, so we want to try to use a peeled post. They have not run it through a lathe. They have not taken any of the meat off of that post. They simply peeled the bark off and then let it dry and then treated it. Typically, that, that will hurt the post. Um, even though they are supposed to be treated to the heart or to the center core, whatever you want to call it, you're probably not going to find very many posts that actually are. So when we cut the top of the post off, you're exposing it. Even if you treat it with something you brush on, that's better than nothing. But if you cut it, uh, you're exposing it to get rain in it. Um, the best thing to do is, is leave the post just like it is. Um, and, and we drive all our posts, so we typically can get them all about the same height. Um, cutting it and trying to make the water run off probably is going to damage, damage it more than it's going to help it. Same way with, uh, you know, you used to go around and see somebody put a piece of tin on top of their post and, and drove a big old nail through it. Well, uh, they've probably created more damage than if they had just left it alone because the water's going to get in there now and, and eat it out from the inside. Um, so. We, we, we don't want to cut them if possible. I'm not saying you won't run into a case where you ha have to, but if we can help it, we do not ever want to cut a post. Uh, decorative timbers, uh, you know, we of course we want to stay away from them. Most decorative timbers that you'll see, you know, going up your walkway or something like that are going to have a residential amount of treatment, not, not suitable for agricultural or real fence use. All right, so we've bought our wire, we bought our post, now we're ready to begin. Driving post. We want to drive our post if possible. Um, a driven post is nine to ten times stronger than a dug post. If you've never seen a driver in action, you'll get to see that today. The ground where we are today is extremely hard. Uh, the cattle have been walking in and out of it for who knows how many years, um, and, and it's a little slower 
than we typically like, but the ground is very hard and the posts are very big. But we drove all the posts yesterday. We left one or two posts to drive today for the demonstration. But if 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 you're going to put the fence up and you don't want to hire a contractor, you don't think you can afford it, I would try to do something, take an extra shift at work, anything, to try and get your pay for somebody to drive your post if you don't have access to a post driver. You will be money ahead if you can drive the post. A lot of um, extension agents or agencies and places nowadays are, are having or buying post drivers to rent out. So there may be a county in this area that might have one you could rent. Um, even if you can't afford the contractor to put the whole fence up, you might call him and ask him, hey, if I get all my posts laid out and lined up, what will you charge me to come just drive the post? Um, a dug post, I'm sure everybody here has, has used the post hole diggers and dug them and tamped them back in, and now you got to wait you know, a week or so to come back and put the wire on. Not with a driven post. Yesterday, we drove the post, and we could have put the wire up yesterday if we wanted to. Uh, there's no waiting. There's, there's nothing. And, and like I said, uh, we're, most fence posts are tapered. We're going to drive the small end in the ground. That way, as it goes in, it's wedging itself in the ground. Um, a taper on a six-inch post, a lot of times, is very hard to see. So it's, it's not going to look weird or funky when it's drove in the ground. Uh, a lot of people will always want to put the big end in the ground. If you're driving the post, you want to drive the small end in the ground. A driven post, you can it's very difficult to get back out. Um, so that's why I was saying planning is so important. If you don't drive it where you really want it, you probably won't get it back out of the ground. Uh, and so some people say, well, you can't drive posts in a straight line. This was all backsided by our main man over there, Mr. Jody. Uh, and as you can see here and in the next picture, they're pretty straight, um, almost perfect, I would say. I hate to use that word because we may uh, mess one up today or something, but those posts are, are very straight. So, you know, once you get used to the equipment and, and you've done it a time or two, uh, you, can, you can do really good with a post driver. All right, the next thing, we'll see a little bit of this today on the farm we're on. Uh, it worked out good. It's going to be a, a little bit of a learning ex experience there for you to see. We want to try to drive our post perpendicular to the ground, which a lot of times people think, God, why in the world is he saying that? We don't like that. But think about it. If a cow walks down the hill or you walk down the hill, how is he walking? He's walking perpendicular to the ground. How is the fence going to run? It's going to run perpendicular to the ground. So we want to, uh, well, it's running parallel to the ground. So we want to uh, drive our post perpendicular. That way all your stays line up. As you can see here, that would have been level. If we had to drove that post perfectly level, that's what it would have looked like. So you're going to have more pressure on some stays than others. And then you might even run out of posts because the angle is different, so you have to have a taller post for the same amount of wire. So we want to run, drive our post perpendicular to the ground. That way all our stays line up. There's equal pressure on every um, line wire of the fence. It's another picture you can see. It's quite the grade there. That would have been level, and you can see how, how the fence is running uphill. Line post, um, as we're driving our line post, depending on what you're doing with the fence, um, you can space them up to 25 feet apart. If we're building a pen where we're going to wean some calves or we're going to dump some cattle in out of the cell barn, something like that, where it's going to be a lot of pressure, I'd probably tighten them back up to 10 or 12 feet. Uh, the farm we're on today, there's not going to be a whole lot of pressure there. It's basically a perimeter fence, so we spaced them a little further apart. Um, you're going to need a brace every 1,320 feet unless you're changing directions, which we'll talk about that in the field a little more. But just talking on a straight line, you don't need a brace, but every 1,320 feet. H braces, they are the foundation of the fence. Whether you're building my fence, Jeremy's fence, uh, any other kind of fence, if you don't build the braces correct and do this right, everything else you do and all the other money you've spent are, is a waste of time. Um, we want to use a, a brace rail that's two and a half times the height of the fence. So typically a cow fence is, is 48 inches tall, so we want to use a 10-foot brace rail. Uh, sometimes that can be hard to find at a, at a farm store, but a lot of stores nowadays are, are carrying 4-inch by 10-foot brace rails. You can also use a piece of 
pipe or something like that if you have it. If you do use a piece of pipe, it needs to be at least a Schedule 40 piece and it needs to be at least two inches. We're, we're gonna use two and seven eighths today. And you'll see why when we put the brace wire on, how tight and how much pressure is on it. Uh, if you use some piece of conduit or something like that, uh, you'll bow it in half. Um, but we wanna, use, we wanna build our brace assemblies just like pictured. We're gonna go over that today and let y'all build one. Uh, this should be, I think, in y'all's book. This is just kind of a materials list and, a, and a, a good explanation and picture of how our specs on our uh, braces need to be built. So if you purchase our wire and you fill out the back of the form, which I'll show you in the field, and turn it in, your wire is under warranty. If your braces aren't built like this, I will not be able to warranty your wire. Uh, this is going to be the most simple efficient, effective way to build a brace. There's a gazillion ways to build a brace, but we will show you and teach you today the most simple and effective way to do it. And this is how it needs to be done on our products if you want you know, the warranty. And even if you just want it to last a long time, uh, this, this brace here will last forever. That's another picture of it there. Uh, we'll go over this more in the field. This is an inline brace. Um, if you're hiring your fence done and you have a contractor that's putting an H brace every 330 feet and you're using high tensile wire for one that's overkill there's no need for that so he's wasting your money and then two even if he stop and stops and terminates to that one post um, the next pool there's there's no brace built there to support the next pool so if you drive down the road and you see H braces built in line in the fence that is a waste of money your contractor's doing that to you. He's spending your money for no reason. This is the only true inline brace. Uh, if you're going to build a brace in a fence, in line, this is the only true one. That way you can terminate to the center post. If I'm pulling from left to right, when I get to there, I'm going to stop, terminate to that post, and then I'm going to tie my next set of wire on to the same post and pull again. That way this center post is supported in both directions. Um, if you can see if you build a simple H here, it can only work in one direction. So when you tie off and go another way, it's not doing any good. It's not doing anything. And 99% of the time, if they're doing that, they're probably not even stopping and tying off here. They're just running by and stapling it to it. So they're spending your money, or, or if you're doing it, you're, you're doing a lot of work for nothing. Uh, so this is the only true inline brace. It supports a pull in any direction. These are some pipe braces. I won't cover that today. Double H braces. This is another big thing a lot of contractors will do that you kind of need to be aware of. And I'm not trying to run contractors down. There's some really good ones. We're just trying to inform y'all, if you do hire somebody, that you kind of have some knowledge to know whether um, they're doing like they need to do or not. Uh, double braces. We do not recommend a double H brace ever. Uh, we want to use one brace rail two and a half times the height of the fence. Uh, if I have a truck stuck in the mud, am I going to take one long rod and try to push him out or am I going to take two short ones and try to push him out? No, it makes no sense to have two braces because if I don't get this center post right here perfect, all I've done is create a joint right here for, for that to fail when pressure is applied to it. Um, if a contractor drives post every day, he can probably get them perfect. I'm not going to disagree with that. We could probably get them perfect. But this brace is no stronger than one single H brace with a brace, brace rail the two and a half times the height of the fence. So this brace will not be any stouter than one brace with a 10 foot long brace rail. A lot of times they'll want to take a six foot post, two six foot posts and make a 12 foot brace here. Um, that, that's, there's no need for that. that. That will not be any more efficient or any more effective than one single H brace with a, a longer brace rail. And it all has to do with the the angle of the wire. We'll go over that more when we get in the field, uh, but it all has to do with the angle of the brace wire. We want to push on this post, not pull up on it. Uh, and and we'll, we'll really touch on that in the field where you can see it and it'll make a whole lot more sense. But double braces, not recommended. We do not recommend double braces. It, you know, we want to try to stay away from those. That's right. Yeah, and when we get out there, we'll talk. We want to try to stay in the top third. I think the specs say that in NRCS. 
um, and then our specs, we try to keep it in the top third. Um, I typically, like today, I'll have two strands of my wire above the brace rail. Uh, it kind of falls out where that's, that's probably more in the upper third, but as long as it's in the top third of the fence, the brace wire angle stays more correct. Um, Yeah, and yeah, that's right. And 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 we're going to go over all that in the field. We we don't want to use a twitch stick. That's what that's called, a twitch stick. Uh, used to, you know, you'd be building fence with your granddad, and he'd send you to the woods to get a piece of rebar or a twitch. Anytime you and and he was probably using low carbon nine gauge brace wire. You go to every farm store in the county, they'll sell you brace wire. It says on it brace wire. It's going to be low carbon and it's going to be 9 gauge. We don't want to use that. We want to use 12 and a half gauge high tensile wire. Same wire we're going to use in electric fence, same wire that's in my fence. Uh, and I think nowadays the NRS or NRCS is making you use high tensile wire. Um, and we want to use a ratchet strainer. Anytime you put a twitch stick and you twist the wire right back over itself and create heat, it's going to break. Uh, you know, when you create heat like that, something has to give. So normally, you're going to get that almost as tight as you want it, and then pow, one strand's going to break. And then also, it's low carbon wire. So even if you get it tight today, you come back tomorrow, it's not going to be tight because it just keeps stretching. So we want to use a, an inline uh, ratchet strainer. We'll go over that in the field. You'll see it. And we want to use high tensile brace wire. We do not want to use twitch sticks, pieces of rebar, or something like that. All right, once our poster are driven, bracer are built, we're ready to put the wire up. Um, you can kick the wire out on the ground like a lot of people do. If you got a lot to do, I would probably say go to your farm store, tractor supply, or something like that, get a payout. Uh, it'll make life a whole lot easier to unroll the wire because those rolls are very heavy. All right, so once we've terminated it to the ends, like I said, we'll go over this in the field where you can actually see it, get your hands on it. It'll make a whole lot more sense. But... Um, since you can pull so many feet of wire at one time with a high tensile wire, a lot of times to get all the slack out, you, you will need to pull in the center instead of the one end. Um, that is a something that probably nobody's ever seen. Uh, we're going to do that today. Uh, the stretch that we're pulling today probably would not need that. It's a short stretch, but for, for classroom teaching sake, we're going to pull it in the center today so you can see how that's done. And that basically, the reasoning for that is because you're pulling 1,300 feet of wire and you're pulling roughly a percent out of it. So you're pulling 13 to 14, 15 feet out of it. If you put your bar at one end, that means you have to pull 15 feet over here to ever get it tight. So to eliminate that, we'll put two bars in it and each bar only has to pull seven feet. And then we're going to meet here in the middle and crimp it together. Um, if you are on shorter pulls like this crew right here is doing, you can use one bar and pull to the end. But when you do that, you're going to want to tie your chains or your come-alongs or whatever it is to your corner post, pull and stop before you go past the corner. Leave yourself enough room to go around the post, terminate, tie off, use gripples, whatever you want to do. We'll go over this more in the field. Um, it'll make a whole lot more sense th then. But we don't ever want to pull past our post staple hard. That's going to twist your post even if they're driven. And uh, we don't ever want to use staples driven in a post hard to hold the wire. Uh, when I install that fence today, it'll be standing straight up and it won't have a staple in it anywhere. Um, we will go back and put staples in it, but the only thing the staple is supposed to do is hold the fence at the right height off the ground. Uh, we, do, we never pull past and staple hard and drive our staple into the post. For one, that can cut the wire, um, and two, if you pull past your corners, they can twist on you, and then your, your brace moves, then your brace rail moves, then your whole brace fails. Uh, so we don't ever want to pull past. But like I said, we'll go over this in greater detail in the field where you can see it make a little more sense. Once we get it pulled tight, we're going to cut our wire and we're going to use splices and splice it back together. This is a picture here of, of me splicing some wire back together. It's easy. Anybody can do it. This is a fence school here and a volunteer. 
All right, I'm not going to go into this a whole lot. She touched on it. Jeremy's going to touch on it. Um, a fixed knot fence with an offset, like you see here in the picture, is probably um, the best fence option that you can do. Um, you're going to have one heck of a perimeter fence, and then if you use a 12 and a half gauge high tensile smooth wire and offsets to go around the perimeter, you have basically run power to your whole farm. So you can hook into it with poly wire, whatever you want to do. You can rotational graze. You can do anything you want, pretty much. Um, and also, it's going to keep them, like she said, from rubbing on your fence. Uh, if you have bulls on one side and heifers on the other, sometimes you may need an offset on the other side also if you have bulls, because I'm sure you all know how hard bulls are to keep in and off your fence. Uh, so offsets, uh, electric, and, and, a, and a fixed knot fence, a great combination. Probably the best fence on the market. In summary, uh, planning. We all go back to planning, 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 planning. If you need to take the time, draw it out, plan everything. That way when you do it, you have to do it one time and it's done right and you like the way it's done. Uh, nobody here likes the fence, I'm sure. We don't want to have to do it multiple times and we don't, as much as stuff costs now, we don't want to waste any money. Every move we make, every step we do, we want to be efficient and cost effective. We don't want to have to do it twice or waste our money. Uh, build good solid braces, install fence properly using the correct tools, uh, and hopefully you won't have to fence for a long time. Any other questions? <laughs>